This time, I again deny you the second instalment of the boat painting extravaganza. Part two will come, I promise, but not yet. The reason? It's been a little bit blowy. And before you all get rude about the British weather again, remember that we tolerate it because we get to live in a place that produced faulty towers, blackadder, beer that tastes of something, and cars that have bonnets and boots, which makes it all okay. In this episode, I'm going to tackle the thorny subject of fuel tanks and how I changed my mind about my choice of primary tank. We're going plastic and just over 100 litres in capacity. The fuel racking system I built in episode 6 has three shelves. The lowest is the pretty solid false floor onto which I'm plonking some protective foam tiles. The middle level is fitted to the racking and the top platform is what you've seen me use as a worktop in previous episodes. It's an absolute last choice location to mount fuel storage to due to the obvious centre of gravity issues, but if I need to go up to nearly 3,000 litres in capacity, it's there for temporary use. So after trying about five camera angles, this is about the only one I can find where you can see both me and this fuel tank down in the belly of Allen. So those of you who have been looking at some of my earlier videos and also some of the social media that I was doing when I was getting Alan ready for the expedition last year that was cancelled, uh, you would have noticed that we were relying on mostly fuel bladders and so you might be slightly surprised to see that I've decided to install this plastic tank. There's a few reasons why. First of all, it's about the right size and the right shape. Secondly, it means I can actually see the fuel level through it because the plastic is translucent and also there's quite a, a large ecosystem of different fixtures and fittings I can have for this, um, for this hatch here so I can attach all sorts of different things. I've also fitted in a breather valve here, which was an aftermarket one, and that's so that if there's a lot of pitching and rolling in the boat, you won't get f fuel sloshing out, but it allows the tank to breathe when fuel is going in and going out, because you don't want any pressure building up in there or a vacuum forming inside the tank. Anyway, so that's the basics. And what I want to do really is have one main supply tank and then a load of auxiliaries, which can then refuel this tank as and when uh, it's ready. And because this is going to be the main supply tank, it's nearest-ish to the engine. So this is the conduit that takes the fuel and return supply lines all the way to the engine, which is only, I guess, three, four feet away. I'm going to give you a more detailed breakdown of the layout and the design decisions that I've made in a second, but I thought I would just give you a general idea about what tank's going in and why. I have to admit, I wasn't delighted with this Diablo hatch here because some of the fixtures and fittings, in particular these end caps, they didn't actually fit particularly well, so I had to use a sharp knife and actually a Dremel once or twice to make sure that they screwed all the way on to get a good seal, and that should not happen. I spoke to the, to the retailer and the manufacturer and they didn't seem to have a particularly good answer, so all I can think of is slightly questionable manufacturing processes. But anyway, they fit properly now. So the initial positioning is fairly straightforward. I've gone for a longitudinal orientation as I think it will attract the least sloshing, but I have a solution to help with that anyhow that's not quite arrived in time for this exquisite visual production. The sternwood end rests against the racking box section, so I fitted a length of shock absorbing rubber. Everything in this setup until the end of the month's sea trials will be fitted only temporarily and then installed more permanently once I'm happy, so it's duct tape for now. For the foam protection, I've ramped it up towards the bow, which is the end without the fuel supply hatch. Whilst it will very slightly reduce capacity, this will encourage fuel to collect towards the stern and so limit any chance of a dry hose. No one wants a dry hose, not least Alan's engine. Although I'll be looking into straps and other ways to keep this tank, destined when filled up to weigh more than an amply sized human being after a substantial meal, my first plan to secure the tank is to make it a press. I want it to be strong and secure, yet fast to change or remove. So here's the prototype. A stainless steel rigging tensioner with a wooden socket on one end and a rubber cup on the other. Once located in the centre of the tank in one of the baffling dimples moulded into it, I can turn the screw to extend the length and so apply a secure pressure, and one that can't shift due to the sockets being at both ends. To make sure that it can't loosen, I slide in a split pin. Now, this series of components contains the foam matting and the rubber cup, so they will take some of the compressive force. It will need testing to see what other sort of securing is needed, especially to stop tank rotation. But I like this. It's simple, quick and robust. All of the bits and bobs on the fuel supply line are flopping around without a home at present, so I need to sort that out. The tank hose fittings, priming bulb and filter aren't all the same diameter, so I had to do a little bit of fiddling with 8 and 10mm adapters. 
but it was all pretty quick and easy. I decided to fit a length of galvanised steel angle parallel to the tank and bolted to the racking uprights. The talon pipe clips you'll have seen me use before were spot on and should hopefully keep the diesel supply line and the return line neat and out of mischief. I've needed to reroute and fiddle with the way I've secured the fuel lines as they travel through the battery box and ballast storage zone and into the engine bay. It'll be in an upcoming episode when I complete this section. Actually, I'm dying to do it as it means the battery box and batteries can be fitted, meaning that they aren't taking up precious space in the cabin. In the bottom will be a perforated heavy-duty rubber matting, then ballast blocks, and then the battery box on top. But the end result is what we've all been waiting for. This was, I promise, the first try once I plugged everything together. So that I don't leave you, mouths wide open, agog, and liable to break into spontaneous and enthusiastic rounds of applause, I'll settle you down with an extra job I wanted to get sorted last week. As you walk from the stern helming section of Allen and into the living, storage and fuel racking zone further forward, you'll likely want something to grab onto to steady yourself, and I don't want anyone falling into the electrics panel. So I earmarked a couple of robust fibreglass surfaces and went in search of spare tubes from the railings on Allen's deck. This wasn't really more complicated than fitting in a couple of railing brackets and then sliding the tube in and locking them with grub screws, but it's a reminder of how careful you need to be when fitting bolts or screws into fiberglass. You only get one shot at it. These were blind surfaces, so I couldn't use bolts, and rivets would have been too narrow and too permanent. If you drill holes for bolts, you simply match the diameters, but here I used heavy-duty large-pitch screws. There are all sorts of charts online, but different screws need different pilot holes. Fiberglass is harder than wood, so if your hole is half a millimetre too small, the screw won't drive in. Half a millimetre too wide, and it'll fly through without biting at all. Then it will fall out. So carefully does it. The finishing touch was to slide on a foam tube that means that any accidental falls will only result in dented pride and not a dented skull or rib. I'll do the same on the other side, but need to work out how to avoid the fuel supply ball valve, which in a sordid display of first come first served, is where I'd ideally place the bracket. Hopefully next time I can complete the second of the painting duo of episodes, as I want it done before sea trials. Last month's sales of new Allen t-shirts and caps really dominated the support donations for my channel, so it's still a big thank you, but the numbers are a little bit lower this month. Check out the link in the description to see how you can help support a little per month. It'll really help me renovate Alan. And also we now have women's fit shirts added to the merch page. Cheers all, and buy my books. Bye.